Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody, and welcome back from the long Thanksgiving Day weekend. We hope that all you guys had a wonderful, safe time with family, friends, and loved ones. And a special thanks to you. A lot of you know I do the No Shave November thing. A normal man, this would be three days of no shaving. For me, this is a month of no shaving. Uh, special thanks to all you guys on my social media who donated to the Cancer uh, Research Funds. We raised over like $4,000. Thank you so much for that. And we're excited to be back doing movie talk. This is also a few weeks of no shaving for me. Yeah. Also here is Jeremy Johns. <laughs> I've been doing no shave November since August, folks. This is the best I got for you. But we're back a little more full, a little happier, and a bit more douchey hair. Also here, Ken Napsock. Hey, I have I live a no shave life, so this has been what I've been. And also, I grew this this morning just despite John Campion. Glad to be here. I think it's gonna be a good show. I promised you to not be a negative Nelly about the nap fest that was Fantastic Beast. I'm gonna be happy here today, John. I'm gonna be a happy internet person today. We're proud of you, Ken. Also, we here's love. Mark Ellis. Uh, the Death Star balloons behind Kenny is just such a perfect metaphor for his personality. You know, I also participate in No Shave November, but we're not talking about my face. Uh. <laughs> Took you guys a minute on a Monday it, morning. It, it, Let's it, get with the program. Me a second. I'm not What's gonna that lie. instrument that blue, like hillbilly bluegrass bands play? It's like a, a metal sheet and they rather thing. That's the sound of him scratching his crotch. I think like that's every a saw. Day. I think that is a saw. Uh, yeah, hey, we got to the... We were in the office this morning, and there was a knock on the door at like 8 in the morning, and some delivery guy came and delivered all these Death Star balloons. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's nice. So we got some Death Star balloons, which <laughs> is, is perfect. Is there a little exhaust port? Like, like, is there just like a little bit of air escaping from him? And mosquitoes are doing a death <laughs> run on this thing. Oh. Um, so, hey, which is per these balloons are perfect for our very first story today. Mm -hmm. Ashley, what is that? The marketing onslaught for Rogue One, a Star Wars story, continues as Disney unveiled another extended sneak peek over the holiday weekend. The film revolves around the events leading up to A New Hope, with Felicity Jones playing Jyn Erso, a rebel leader tasked with assembling a team to steal the Death Star plans. The movie is ready for its wide release on December 16th, with tickets going on sale today. John, what do you think of the new extended trailer for Rogue One? Uh, well, first of all, even before I get to the trailer itself, it's funny because last night, um, we, Ann and I love Star Wars, so Ann gets on, even though we're going to the premiere uh, on the 10th, <laughs> uh, Ann jumped online to buy her tickets for Rogue One for opening night because we like going to opening night with everybody too. And she could not get tickets. She got put into this like waiting queue for like 40 minutes and then got disconnected, tried another site, same thing happened, tried another site and then she finally succeeded. But I, once again, they broke the internet. Now, it was nowhere near as bad as when The Force Awakens came out because I think a lot of these ticketing sites learned their lesson. They got a lot of technical lessons. They realized, oh, if we do this, and they fixed a lot. And it wasn't nearly as bad, but still a lot of people had long waiting lines, online long waiting lines, to buy their tickets, which I think is very cool that there's still this much anticipation, this much excitement for a anthology movie basically that's coming out that's not a part of the episodic uh, thing of Star Wars so that's great to see the new trailer 90 85% eh, of it is just footage we've seen already but the extra little few things they put in got me excited I, I I cannot believe how excited I'm getting for this movie I am getting really hyped for this movie I mean it's a Star Wars movie so I was always going to be excited about it but I am finding myself drooling in the mouth waiting for this thing. So I loved it. I don't know. Mark, you saw it. What did you think? I'm getting pretty revved up for this flick, John. And I'm, I'm excited to meet new characters that are probably going to be dead in the two hours that the movie takes place. But before that happens, I cannot wait to have this adventure where I know a lot of the background for this story. We ultimately know what's going to happen with the Death Star plans. But seeing that adventure take place with humans and droids and space monkeys is very exciting <laughs> to me. Seeing all the fans last night, I'm sure you guys got it on Twitter, too where they're they're in they, they were in like the waiting room queue where like fandango and those kind of ticketing sites created a waiting room and there's two kinds of waiting rooms in life there's the nice easy one where you go in you have a lollipop you read a highlights and then you get into the doctor's office then there's like the beetlejuice waiting room where you're like i could be here for 125 years that's what it felt like to a lot of fans last night i hope y'all got your tickets because this is going to be a doozy jeremy hey there goes elvis look hey <laughs> <laughs> just me thinking that for the first time in like 20 years oh yeah i'm 
I'm looking yeah. forward to Rogue One um, more than any movie the, that I'm look, I've been looking forward to in 2016. That said, this is the tough part for me because before I came on Movie Talk, this is about the time I would stick my head in the sand and never watch another trailer for this movie that's coming out because I want to keep the anticipation. I, I don't want to know certain things, certain shots, certain moments. And so when coming on Movie Talk, I was like, Oh my god, I actually came in, I asked John, I was like, I don't suppose there's a way for me not to watch this trailer. It's like, no, you have to watch it for the show. So, um, I, I, back in my day, kids, we would have a final trailer come out two months before the movie, and then we wouldn't see another one. That's the world I like. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to this movie. I'm jacked for this movie. I don't want to see too many trailers for this movie, which is what this, this trailer did for The Threshold for me. What do you think, Ken? In my day, the newspapers would say a lot about the movie. You'd buy a ticket that you waited for hours right. and wouldn't be spoiled. Speak of Gramps. Um, look, as a trailer, I love this trailer. Mm -hmm. I had problems with the second full-length Rogue One trailer. Right. I, there were some dialogue issues. There's This K2SO moment's not my favorite. It's kind of like slapsticky comedy. But I'm telling you, I actually love this trailer. There's some great stuff in it. Too bad some of the new footage resolves tension brought up in the other trailers. Mm. Donnie Yen's in trouble. Baze Malbus is going to save him. That ATACT looks fierce. Oh, no, it's gone. So there's some real problems I have with these extra moments. But again, I know the marketing machine we're in. I know people don't know what's going on. And this is cool. There's some cool mm. images and moments and sequences that I'm sure people are like, damn, I'm going to go see this, who might not have been opening day weekend people. So it's a win for me. I'm trying not to be the grumpy guy. There's some things I didn't like, but it <laughs> but was overall a great thing. That is the one thing. That is the one thing, though, about this particular trailer. It's like, if in the first trailer we saw that scene where the guy takes the rocket launcher, hits the at, -AT in the side of a head, and then we see an X-Wing swoop in and take it out, that would have been fine. But in the first trailer, you just showed us the rocket launch, and then you, and you didn't show us the X-wing, and now you show us the resolution of that scene. Right. It, I think that was a mistake. Yeah. If it was just the first trailer, I ate it up, and as a trailer, I ate it up. But yeah, yeah. I do, I do kind of wish they didn't put that shot in there. But it is great because the first time we see that moment, he hits the thing, and and the ATACT goes, hey. uh, and you're like, oh, yeah. 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 now I know that doesn't that how it pays off. But again, I get it. I get it. It's and how I, we have to I it. checked out the trailer that Riley brought up at our pre-production meeting this morning where it's it's footage you've already seen, but it's just Darth Vader breathing over it. Yes. And it's just, uh, it's pretty cool, guys. It's pretty yeah. If I could hear one person breathe for the rest of my life, it would be that guy. <laughs> yeah, you know what's funny is a trailer for a Star Wars movie at this point is not going to change anyone's mind. If you're going to go see this movie, you were going to already go see. It's not like this trailer is going to be like, you know, now... Now I'm on board, you know? And if you weren't going to see it, well, then you're you're actually one of the more angry people I know in life. And and no, no more for you. Are you okay. talking about me? So here's here's the thing. Like, with now with this final trailer out, okay? And you guys have seen the final trailer now. And you get an idea about what will the average film fan think about this trailer. And knowing that, once again, movie ticketing sites had a problem keeping up with demand last night. We want to ask you guys a question. Go to our Twitter, and our Twitter is simply at Collider Video. So if you go on Twitter, we're at Collider Video. We're going to put up a poll right now. And the poll question is simple. Will Star Wars Rogue One make over or under $150 million on its opening weekend? They said the tracking was at what, like 130 something? I think mm -hmm. they said the tracking was yeah. originally. So now with these ticketing problems in the final trailer, do you think Star Wars Rogue One will make over or under $150 million opening weekend. That's on our Twitter page right now. Go check it out and vote. We will check in at the end of the show to see what you guys had to say about that. Okay, with that out of the way, Ashley, what's next? 20th Century Fox dropped a pre-Thanksgiving surprise for fans of the Alien franchise. The studio unveiled the very first poster for Alien Covenant, director Ridley Scott's follow-up to Prometheus. The poster <coughs> also revealed that Fox has moved up the release date from August 4th, 2017 to a new date of May 19, 2017. Michael Fassbender returns from Prometheus, joining a new crew of explorers that includes Katherine Watterson, Danny McBride, and Billy Crudup. Jeremy, what do you think of the new poster for Alien Covenant? That that is as uh, subtle and alien as aliens ever been. You see the first <laughs> alien poster, the first one just, it's the egg cracking and it's just, uh, in space, no one can hear you scream. It's a definite throwback to that. Anytime you have the alien, I'll like doing his alien thing that's as alien as it can be and it looks like this will be the binder that ties prometheus to the alien movies because uh, harloff and i got into well, we 
argued, like actually all over the phone. I wasn't here yet. So I'm like, no, Mr. <laughs> Harloff, it's this. And so we, um, it was whether or not Prometheus is an alien prequel or an alien spinoff. I said it's more of a spinoff because there's no real binder to tie in the universe. And even the Xenomorph at the end looks a bit different. This one ties it together where it's like, no, it's all part of one saga now. So I think it's great. I think it's a perfect poster for it. The poster is genius. And here's why. One of the big problems marketing wise that they had with that uh, first one that mm -hmm. I didn't like very much with Prometheus. Honestly, it didn't work for me. It didn't click. Visually beautiful, <clears throat> stunning to look at. Yeah. Didn't quite work for me. But the marketing problem that they had was a lot of people were very confused about, wait a minute, what is this movie? Because Ridley Scott said they were purposely trying to stay away from mm -hmm. the Xenomorphs. They don't want to really talk about the aliens per se. They wanted a standalone movie. And that caused some connection problems, I think, with a lot of audience. Maybe some, the similar type of connection problems that Star Wars is having with right now, making people understand where Rogue One fits in to the overall Star Wars story. A lot of people didn't even know that Prometheus was an alien movie in a way because they were trying to separate it. I think they realized that mistake. How do we know they realized that was a mistake? Because look at this poster. <laughs> no confusion, no question whatsoever, folks. This is an alien movie, and they're getting in, uh, ahead of it, and I think it's actually a brilliant move for them on that part. I also like that they moved it up for three months. We always get a little bit worried when they hear they push a movie back. Hearing that they're moving it up, especially to a May release date, that is actually a much more prime date than an August date was. So this is pretty good news all the way around. Mark, what do you think? Oh, I love the confidence, man. It's just great to see the Xenomorph back on a poster because you always heard these rumors about, well, Prometheus, it, it, yes, it, it takes place in the same universe, and how Ridley Scott didn't want to involve Xenomorphs in his next film either. That is done, man. And not only do we get a great-looking poster, but that May 2017 God, that sounds Fine good. Date. The only people who hate that news is the good folks over at Annabelle 2. Because that movie <laughs> is coming out on May 19, 2017. And it's not, you got that, you got the nut job too. You have Diary of a Wimpy Kid too. And you have Baywatch coming out that weekend. It's a stacked weekend. But I think with this and the fact that they're trying to sell it using the Xenomorph, leaning on that iconic alien look, that's going to mean Mil tens of millions of dollars of difference in box office take. If they didn't have that as their chief marketing strategy, that this movie might have made $100 million less than it's going to now, in my opinion. And another reason why Annabelle 2 should be worried, this isn't like counter-programming. Remember Sisters opened up mm -hmm. against, oh, what did Sisters open uh, 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 up? The, the Force, Force Awakens, Awakens, right? Yeah. That was actually worked for them because it was counter-programming. This ain't counter-programming. This is a lot of the people who would see Annabelle 2 if they were going to go see it mm -hmm. are going to be more interested in an alien film. This so that's mm -hmm. like a double whammy, I guess. Anyway, Ken, what do you think? The teeth, the drool, the words run. This is exactly what yeah. I use as my Tinder profile picture. <laughs> 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 this is great. Uh, no, nah, this is great. This is this is subtle marketing that ties into what people love about uh, this world. I'm not a giant alien fan, so that kind of led to me enjoying, enjoying Prometheus. I actually thought it was good, and I, right. felt, I felt like I had to hide that opinion in a, in a bucket. Um, and, and the move up, you're all right. You've, you've all said things I agree with. The move to May shows that there's a confidence in this, uh, that Danny McBride probably hit a home run in this movie, and they're ready to show the world. That's kind of exciting, and I love subtle marketing and kind of franchise kind of movies where it's like hinting at what we all know and love, and, it, and that you're gonna get it. So it was, this is great. All right, what's next? It's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by AMC Theaters. Disney's Moana topped the extended holiday box office, taking in $81.1 million for an easy number one over the five-day weekend. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them took the number two spot with a $65.76 million five-day performance. Doctor Strange pulled in $18.85 million over the five-day weekend for the number three spot, crossing the $200 million mark domestic. Paramount Pictures' Alice Allied snagged the number four spot with 18 million over its five day opening weekend. And rounding out the top five is Arrival. The sci fi drama took in 15.6 million over the five day weekend and has made 62.38 million domestic on a 47 million budget. Ken, what'd you think about the holiday box office weekend? 
I think it is a great victory for Disney for making such a, a wonderful movie. And people know I don't like animated movies. Throw that out. I love that what I see here, um, that it is a victory for a wide story that connects with a lot of people, but also a movie that celebrates a culture that kind of gives it a, 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 a marketing win that will encourage Disney to do this even more. That's encouraging to me. Fantastic Beasts, no matter what I thought about it, it's a juggernaut. It's going to keep going. And Strange, still hanging around, going to make the big money. Those Marvel pictures, they, they know what to do. <laughs> Jeremy. There's a, there's a lot of Disney on that thing, man. That's a lot of Disney <laughs> making of Disney. some money. You think, is that where these Death Stars came from? Were they like, thanks, guys. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, it, none, none of it surprises me. Um, I am glad that Arrival's hanging on in the top five. I really am, because I really loved Arrival. I thought Arrival was great, and so I'm glad it's it's on the top five. But everyone played their part perfectly in this. You know, Moana, you have the family movie. All right, Thanksgiving. What do we do now that we're, like, st stuffed up on tryptophan and we're passing out? Let's go hey, take the kids to go watch a movie. Boom, it was there. Uh, and then if they didn't watch, oh, Moana sold out. It's okay. We have Fantastic Beasts. Or you have Doctor Strange. Like, none of it's surprising. This is exactly the one, two, three I thought this weekend was going to be. And, uh, and so that's what we got. Thank you for being predictable, America. Uh, what's really impressive is Fantastic Beasts, 39% drop. Just a 39% drop from no. week. That's with Moana opening up. So, I mean, and, and Doctor Strange still being in theaters. That's a really impressive number for Fantastic Beasts. The movie's already made like $470 million worldwide. Just Fantastic I mean, Beasts? It, it's crazy. What's that? Fantastic Beasts? Fantastic Beasts, yes. It's already made like over 400. Like, so the question we had about will they go the full five movies they said they're going to do? We said, well, let's wait and see how the first one does. The, the question is now completely answered with an explanation point. They're moving forward with five films. They may even stretch this thing out to eight films. Who knows? <laughs> as far as Moana goes, I took a little bit of time this week because I love Pixar. You know, so it, I think it's my favorite animation company out there. I really enjoyed Finding Dory. But then I saw K Kubo and the Two Strings. And it's like, okay, no, this is my favorite animated film of the year. Uh, over Pixar. It, it, it's this. I was not expecting much out of Moana. It, it is the best, to me, it is the best animated film of the year. It's better, better than Kubo and the Two Strings. It's better than Finding Dory. It's better than Zootopia. It's be I was shocked. I thought, because every once in a while, I mentioned this last week too, every once in a while Disney will put out a little bit of a throwaway mm -hmm. animated film that you can do. We, they do that every couple of years. And I honestly thought, I admit it, I thought Moana was going to be one of those. I've seen it twice now. I can't believe how heartfelt it is, how good the music in it is. Mark my words, I think... Not The Rock, but Lin-Manuel Miranda is going to get nominated for The Rock song, You're Welcome. I really do think that's going to get nominated for an Oscar, that song. The mythology behind it is beautiful. There's character development. It's just a wonderful film. But the other thing that really stands out to me, something I was really excited about, Warren Beatty coming back to directing again. And his film, uh, Rules Don't Apply, is now officially the lowest money-making opening weekend for a wide-release film of 2016. It, on <laughs> over 2,300 screens, made $1.5 million. Which, and, and, you know, it's a good movie. I, it wasn't as good as I was hoping it would be. It would certainly deserve better 1.5, but that number coming in 12th place. Behind Loving, The Edge of 17, Hacksaw Ridge, which has been out for like six or seven weeks, uh, that's got to be a real disappointment for them. So that's what stands out to me. What about you, Mark? Yeah, that's like Gem of the Holograms type. Yeah, you know, yeah, it really is. Right there. But on the other side of the ledger is the very encouraging Moana. I mean, I wasn't shocked to see the movie do that well because it is a wide Disney release. But I think it's so important to see that it's a new culture represented in a Disney film for the very first time. Is seeing the Pacific Islands and how well they were represented in this movie and the fact that so many people wanted to come out and check this movie out is really, really encouraging to me. The other interesting interesting thing that I am a little shocked that is Fantastic Beast and how well that hold up like maybe you're like what Jeremy said and people just wanted to go out and see Moana and if it was sold out we go see Fantastic Beast but it, I am surprised it's doing that well and it does look like we're going to get more of those movies Arrival only dropped seven percent that is so nice to see a movie that is critically yep. lauded as it is. It might not be the most consumer-friendly film of all time. It's a thinker. You go in. You don't need popcorn. You need something smart like a pear, but it's worth it, and a lot of people are going to check that out. I'm impressed. That's what you said, though, that, and that braced me for it. Before I yeah. went to see Arrival, you are like, bring an apple. I went to Panera Bread, and they were like, would you like chips? I was like... I'll take an apple. I have a movie to watch. And I watched Arrival, and I loved it. Thank you, Mark Ellis. That's why I'm here. All right, guys. We've reached that part of the show. Not for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? 
Paramount Pictures has unveiled a new trailer for the highly anticipated stage play adaptation, Fences. The movie, directed by Denzel Washington, is scripted by playwright August Wilson and stars Washington and Viola Davis, who both reprised their roles that won them both Tony Awards on Broadway. The film opens in theaters on December 25th. Mark Byer saw the new trailer for Fences. It's uh, another Fences trailer, and it's another huge buy for me, Ashley. This thing has Oscar material written all over it. As somebody who actually studied the play Fences in college in an entire semester it looks like an accurate and faithful representation of the play i know that a lot of members of this cast and crew have done the broadway performance of fences this looks like it could sweep the oscars and surprise a lot of people and i also think based on this trailer it does have a lot of appeal i think it's going to make some money on christmas day as well there's a lot of buzz, like a lot of the critics. I have not seen the film yet. I don't think any of us at the table no. have seen the film yet. But the word I'm getting from a lot of people who have seen it is Viola Davis, Denzel Washington will both probably get uh, Best Lead Actor nominations. Denzel could be up for Best Director for this. And it will definitely, the, the word I'm hearing is it will definitely get one of the nomination spots for Best Picture. And the trailers support that. I was just, that first trailer shocked me with just how much oomph it had. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it didn't hold back. It put, mm -hmm. it threw out a lot of the, those the emotional fastballs, if you will. They worked. The second trailer did it just as effectively for me. So for me, it's a huge buy. I love this trailer. What about you? Yeah, nothing will be as effective as that first trailer where he Denzel's just monologuing to his, his kid. Son. Oh. Yeah, it's just, there's something about the subtlety there and just the 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 pure moment of it. But this trailer, again, just built on that. Uh, it, it showed you more of what the movie as a whole is about. And yeah, it, it's going to be impactful to a lot of people. I feel like this story is applicable to more people than people might think. You know, this is a... Yeah. A lot of people are going to walk out of there in tears, and uh, so I'm I'm looking forward to it in that in that almost painful way. You know, right. it's just like yeah, flog me, baby. But uh, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm 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 looking forward to it. I really I really really am. Which is ironically your Tinder headline. Yeah, uh, anyway. absolutely, flog me, baby. <laughs> what do you Boom. think? Ed? This is a big buy for me, like Mark said. It's got all the elements of that award winner type thing, including Denzel yelling and inspirational oh, yeah. but tough thing. Uh, <laughs> and it's for me, Denzel is a director, two previous efforts that we, you know, I. I good but he's not known for that I wonder if this is going to be a transition as he goes later in his career to start telling some of these stories and they're important stories to tell it's got universal appeal it's got cultural appeal and and and, and renas, uh, renas, I can't say the word today uh, I'm not I'm not just Resi I eat, resonance I, learned I, that I in haven't college eaten too. a pear yet at a movie theater yeah. so <laughs> treat yourself uh, to a pear it's a, it's a softer crunch than an apple so it won't disturb the people around it's a respectful around. treat in the movies uh, the but I definitely treat. buy this one all right what's next the first trailer for Goon, Last of the Enforcers, has landed online. The sequel to the 2011 cult comedy will see Sean William Scott back as hockey enforcer Doug the Thug Glatt. Though he's retired now, Doug will be lured back to the ice in search of glory. Liam Schreiber is also set to return for the sequel alongside Jay Baruchel, who also directs. The film opens in Canada on March 17, 2017, with no U.S. release date set at this time. John Byersall, the first trailer for Goon, Last of the Enforcers. You know, I like the first Goon movie. It's one of these little films that just jumped up and like people started saying, have you seen this little film Goon? And then you watch like, this is really good. But I was one of those people who didn't think, you don't make another one. There's yeah. really nowhere to go per se. Plus, it wasn't all that successful per se. And then I saw the trailer. I said, yeah, no, just sign me up. I'm going to watch this thing. I thought it looked, it had all the charm that the, it felt like it had all the charm that the original had. I love seeing that Schreiber was back. I was a little bit worried he wouldn't come back but I'm glad to see him back. This looks like it could be every bit as good as the original, so for me, it's a buy. Yeah, you know, my old boss, uh, he was like, every week, he'd be like, you haven't seen Goon yet? When I worked at the theater, he's like, you gotta see Goon! And next week would go by, he's like, did you see Goon over the weekend? This went on for months upon months. Uh, he's a big hockey fan, so I mean, he loved Goon. I wanted to see Goon. I, I loved Slapshot, you know, it kind of looked like a throwback to movies like that. Um, never saw Goon, uh, wanted to see Goon, loved the trailer for the first Goon. Look, love the trailer for the second Goon. I have nothing attaching me to it, but I am interested to see how uh, Jay Baruchel uh, yeah, directs his director. directorial debut, I believe. So I want to see how he does on that. But, I mean, I still want to see the first Goon. Ken. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely going to buy it. I did watch Goon, and I agree with you guys. It kind of is that sleeper thing. I worry about comedy sequels. Yeah. I think we all, and they're getting the gang back together, but there's a different take on it, and there seems to be a legitimate story here. Last of the Enforcers, retired, coming back. Will that 
you know, will that play out in an entertaining fashion? I, I do worry about that, but I'm just going to buy because it's such a fun movie. Yeah, but by the way, for those of you who don't know what an enforcer is, and I know a lot of my American friends don't know what an enforcer is in hockey. An enforcer used to be, they don't really exist anymore. No. An enforcer used to be, let's say you have a superstar on your team. If the other team started to mistreat your superstar, out would come your enforcer. Now, back in the day, back in the glory days of the Edmonton Oilers when Wayne Gretzky was pretty much the best athlete in the world and just like, doing whatever, nobody, it was an unwritten rule, nobody touched Wayne Gretzky. Now, the Edmonton Oilers also had this big halting dude named Dave Cementhead Semenko, <laughs> was his name, right? And he normally just sat on the bench. And then somebody would run Wayne Gretzky into the boards, and you knew it, turn the camera to the Edmonton bench, over the boards comes Dave Semenko, who would proceed to find the guy that put Gretzky into the boards and beat the living hell out of him. <laughs> Gretzky loved this guy so much that when Wayne Gretzky won MVP at an all-star game one year, the, the, uh, the award they got was like the big new Ford truck. Gretzky took the keys and gave it to Dave Semenko. He is an icon in hockey forever. But anyway, that's what an enforcer is. Mark, you had a chance to see this trailer. What do you think? Oh, it's a giant buy for me as well, John, because what I appreciate about the first Goon movie, which was the best sequel to Happy Gilmore we could have ever hoped for, <laughs> yeah. it was like Happy's back on the ice playing hockey. I put that on. Christian and I watched it on VOD when we were just starting the Schmoes channel, and it was such a surprise. We were just laughing for two hours, and it did what I wanted it to do, where it wasn't just making fun of like, oh, let's see how many people we can beat up and let's make this movie like jackass it did stress in a very funny way that there's a code of chivalry amongst enforcers like what you were talking about john mm -hmm. where it's not dopes like marty mcsorley who take it way too far it's people that have a role to play on their team and when that's no longer there bringing somebody back like sean william scott's character the casting in this movie top to bottom looks so appealing to me i'm a big fan of why russell all of a sudden kim coates looks perfect as the coach again yeah this is going to be a sleeper surprise and i think it's going to be one of the those rare comedy sequels that actually works. It should be noted, Jeremy and I were brought into Collider about the same time. I'm the enforcer for Jeremy Johns. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, you he's come so at sure. Jeremy and his pretty YouTube hair, I'm going to take you out, all right? Hakuna Matata, baby. Hakuna Matata. <laughs> all right, what's next? In addition to moving up the release date for Alien Covenant, 20th Century Fox has also set a new release date for the Kingsman sequel. Kingsman The Golden Circle has been pushed from June 16, 2017 to October 6, 2017, squaring off directly with Blade Runner 2049. Fox has also snagged November 2, 2018 and February 14, 2019 for two new yet-to-be-titled Marvel movies. Also of note, Fox has reserved December 21st, 2018 for an untitled Lightstorm production. Lightstorm is James Cameron's production company, which is expected distri to distribute the Avatar sequels. So this might be confirmation that the long in development Avatar 2 finally has a release date locked. Mark Byers said that the December 21st, 2017 2018 release date Fox set is for James Cameron's Avatar 2. I am running low on cash because I bought everything so <laughs> far and I'm going to spend the rest of my money on this being the release date for the new Avatar movie because it makes sense if Avatar is going to be in some sort of power struggle with Star Wars wrestling over dominating the holiday season where you're going to get the Han Solo spinoff movie in May of 2018 and you're not going to have a Star Wars movie as far as we know coming out that Christmas so now Avatar can come in and be that big special effects blockbuster that everybody hopes it's going to be. The interesting news to me is Kingsman moving its release date, giving it a little more time to breathe. Maybe just yeah. scared of Alien Covenant. We don't know. But going back to October, I don't think it's going to have any problem with Blade Runner 2 and it's going to be the hit of that weekend. Uh, I'm going to sell this. I do not look. Do I believe that that May 18th date is the Avatar sequel? Yep, I do believe it, but it ain't going to happen until it actually happens. I do not believe it's going to happen. Remember, um, Alien. No, sorry, not Alien. Um, Avatar 2 was supposed to come out in 2014. <laughs> it was then pushed to 2015 and then pushed to 2017. And now they're talking December 2018. And I, I'm sorry, look, I, all the respect to the world, I love that James Cameron is wants to do it right and nail it, and I think that's the best thing to do. But until I buy a ticket, I do not believe anything they say about this movie having an actual release date. I expect it to be pushed to 2027 at some point. Anyway, Ken, what do you think? Uh, I'm going to sell. I try. I want to come on here and create some drama and disagree with you here, John. And go, no, but you're right. This camera's going to ah, the blue creatures. Ain't, they ain't looking normal. I can't. I got to fix it. And you know what? I don't think that Han Solo movie stays in May. I think Rogue One sends that Han Solo movie to December. 
I think they want to. I think they want to spread out the marketing, the money, and everything. And I think Han Solo takes on James Cameron, and uh, that's why I'm still. I just don't worry about release. Well, dates. do you think if they move Han Solo to Christmas 2018, <laughs> yeah. that might be time for James Cameron to be like, I'm just gonna. I'm you gonna, know what? You know what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that, that's what's going to happen, is that they're going to move Han Solo to December, and James Cameron's going to be like, well, I was going to come out with it, now it's 2027, because of Han Solo, <laughs> and there's going to be a reason for it. It's so funny, the fact that it's like, oh, this this movie that is an, it's an unknown James Cameron movie, it's Avatar 2, because it became Avatar 2, and then it was like, all right, I'm going to make two sequels. You're going to make two, so it's going to be a trilogy? Yep, all three of them. All three <laughs> movies? No, three sequels. You're, make, you're making three sequels? All four. <laughs> Four sequels. This, we're now going to go five sequels. <laughs> it just exponentially this, jumps, and I agree with you. I'll believe it when I'm in the theater, not when I buy the ticket. Yeah. When I'm sitting in the theater and it actually comes on, and I see the like blue people fighting, I'll be like, "Oh, it is Avatar. That's awesome." Here's what I don't want to see happen, though. Like, if you need to move off that release date because the movie's not ready, that's fine, or because you're concerned about if Han Solo gets put on that, you don't want to tangle with Star Wars. Don't give me the excuse that we're waiting for that, you know, BS 3D technology. The nude 3D where it's like, you know, in 5D or whatever the hell, like the, the, the tails actually come out and tickle your nose. I don't want to have that be the reason why they push it. Mark Ellis, I, I love that you're asking for honesty among Hollywood. Bless you. I want, you. Honest, so where, I want bless answers. You. So then where would you like the tail to come out and tickle you? I'm just, I'm just curious. At the part where I don't shave for no shave November. <laughs> On that note, we do this show live every day. So if you're watching us live right now, we take a little bit of time at the end of the show to take some of your live Twitter questions. You can jump on Twitter right now. Make sure you're following us at Collider Video and start tweeting in your questions and Wendy will pick out a couple to ask at the end of the show. I want to remind you too that Movie Talk is not the only show that's here on Collider Video today. A little bit earlier today, our newest installment of Crash Course dropped, and it is everything you need to know about Star Wars Rogue One before seeing the movie. Our very own Christian Harloff hosts that one. Go and check that out. Comment on it and share it around. A lot of people already have. I also want to remind you that TV Talk drops today at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And also the newest episode of our Walking Dead recap show went up last night. You can find that on our channel as well. Well, with that out of the way, it's time for Mailbag. Listen, guys, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Ashley, what have you picked out of the mailbag today? Zach M. writes, Hey, Collider crew, love the show. My question is, what would you guys like to see in a Mad Max Fury Road sequel? George Miller has expressed interest in making more Mad Max films, so what would you like to see? Would you like a sequel to explore more of Max's backstory, perhaps his wife and children, that are briefly seen in flashbacks in Fury Road? Or would you like to see a Furiosa spin-off, considering most people felt she was the strongest character in the film? Thanks and keep up the great work. I'm one of those very rare and unpopular people that I didn't flat out love Mad Max Fury Road. I really enjoyed it. Like, if you had to break everybody into two camps, did you like the film or dislike the film? I'm one of the people who liked the film. I enjoyed it. I thought it was quite good. I, I just, I didn't think it was like top three best movies of the year like a lot of my uh, more intelligent friends did. It was just one of those <laughs> things to me. So I'm not clamoring for a Mad Max sequel personally, although I quite enjoyed it. But if they were to do one, and George has come, come back, I am far more fascinated with the Furiosa storyline because she's the only one that they give a real potential mythology behind. Like with the tribe that she comes from and all that kind of stuff, they introduce a lot of things that you could explore more, not in a prequel sense, but moving forward. So if they were to do it, I'm, I'm with you. I believe the Furiosa one is the thing that would probably get my attention most in this world. Jeremy, what about you? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'm one of those people where uh, if you want to explore the backstory of Mad Max as a wife and son, I suppose you could watch the original Mad Max with Mel Gibson. It does that. So at that point, <laughs> do I want a remake of Mel Gibson's Mad Max or do I want a Furiosa movie? I I want a Furiosa movie. I just hope they don't try to go like, oh well, let 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 let's explore before she was a warrior when she was. A, I, I I don't really want to know too much of that. Just give Furiosa her gun and her robotic hand and have her go out there and straight up just tear up tribes and 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 shitheads. Let's do that. So yeah, Furiosa movie for sure. Ken. I would like them to choose a direction and just keep going and not turn around at any point in the movie. Just oh, kind right. of 
Americans. Um, no, uh, you know, I, I like the movie, too. I'm like you, John. I, I watched it on a plane. This was a great experience, even on a plane with my earbuds in. It was good. Um, but I don't want to see character prequel moments. I don't want to mm -hmm. see that stuff. That can kind of take away from the movie Mad Max. You know, if it, the, you know, Mad Max starts at this point, and we learn too much about the past, and you're right, that's, they already kind of dove into that. Uh, send these characters, or maybe just Furiosa, on another adventure, so to speak, in another direction. Otherwise, you know, hey, it's a good Burning Man uh, recruitment video, <laughs> and uh, it's good stuff. What do you think? I would love to see a sequel to Mad Max Fury Road where you further the story that we got in that movie, because I love using words and phrases like high octane and fuel injected when I'm talking about movies, and Mad Max Fury Road 2 would give me an opportunity to do just that. I think they could take a page out of The Walking Dead's book. When The Walking Dead is good, it's when we're furthering that plot line and we, we discover new communities that we didn't know existed before and how is that going to factor in to what we already know so i want to see them go somewhere new and have to tangle with a new group of baddies and who's their leader going to be you guessed it mel gibson bring mel gibson <laughs> back and let him fight the other mad max and then they can you know they the both die and then furiosa gets her own movie I, I actually was convinced they were going to do that i thought that okay you have tom hardy's mad max mm -hmm. and then i thought they were going to bring in mel gibson as the bad guy i thought he was going to be what we be found perfect. out was a morton joe and then uh mad uh tom hardy's mad max was going to be the kid with the boomerang and i believe it was mad max too mm -hmm. i thought he was going to be him and that's still a theory out there as to whether or not he could be him but it's not confirmed so i do like the fact there's no confirmation but i totally thought they were going to do that and i don't think it, it would it would fall into the category of stunt casting either because you could have pinned that on Expendables 3 when Mel Gibson came back as the bad guy and it's like he's just getting a paycheck he committed to that movie man if yeah. Mel Gibson can commit to Expendables 3 when nobody else wanted to commit to it he is definitely going to give it his all in Mad Max Fury Road 2 you know speaking of Mad Max and Moana if you've seen Moana there is a scene in Moana that is very clearly influenced by Mad Max Fury Road. It was actually great. I loved it. I ate it up. I won't spoil it in case you haven't seen it, but when you see the movie, you'll know exactly which one I'm talking about. Okay, what's next? Rocky Drago writes, Greetings, Collider crew. And looking ahead to the films coming in 2017, I noticed how incredibly stacked of month March is. Films such as Logan, Kong Skull Island, Beauty and the Beast, Power Rangers, etc. make this look more like a summer month, like May or July, instead of a typical spring month. So out of the movies coming out in March of 2017. What are your top three most anticipated? Thanks and bring on the filthy. You know, one that isn't on my top three, and I don't know if it'll be on any of our top three, but one that you should definitely keep your eye open for is the new James Gunn, the director of uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy films. His new film uh, that he produces, The Belko Experiment, comes out. And mm. they just dropped the first teaser for that uh, this weekend. It looks fascinating. It's got a little bit of a number of different things in it, and I think it looks really fascinating. It is a stacked, stacked month. You're talking about like Train Spotting, Kong, Beauty and the Beast, Belko, King Arthur, Power Rangers. Um, not the babe, the boss baby. Who cares? Um, okay, this is going to be my top three. <clears throat> Number three for me is actually going to end up being Ghost in the Shell. Uh, that one has got my attention. I think visually it looks really good. So I, it's I, I'm not super stoked about it but they've done enough to make me think this could be something really special. So that's gonna be number three for me. Number two is what I think a lot of people will expect to be my number one is Logan. Logan, I mean that trailer, best trailer of the year, I, absolutely. I cannot wait to see Logan, but I'm going to have to admit the number one film for me that I'm looking forward to the most just to see what they do with this thing is Beauty and the Beast. Be, like, because I love the, the first animated film of all time to be nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars. It's coming back. It is a beloved property. I love what I've seen so far from the images and from the trailer. So, yeah, for me, number one is Beauty and the Beast. Number two is Logan. Number three is Ghost in the Shell. Mark, what about you? I don't agree with you, but I want you to sell that Beauty and the Beast, baby, because we need $200 million <laughs> when it opens in March. Uh, Beauty and the Beast is going to make my top three but just barely because ghost in the shell and free fire is another movie that comes out that mm. i'm hearing really good things about just missed it so i'm gonna give beauty and the beast the nod at number three at number two i'm gonna have logan and it was a it was a dog fight but it really wasn't because kong skull island it just i i saw the trailers yeah. i love the trailers <laughs> if i hated the trailers i would still put kong skull island at number one because it's Kong, man. It's my it's boy. Kong. He's back. He's back, and, I, and I'm and i so excited to see how they spin this into making Kong a hero right up front, where he's the guy we're going to be rooting for against Godzilla, who they kind of made a hero in the last one, too. So as much as I want to see Logan and what they do with that and how they close all that stuff, it's called Kong Skull Island. You got me and two large corns. Ken. 
Um, that, that March, what a great time to be movie fans because yeah. March is now a battlefield. Um, for me, I'm going to go one to three. Number one, uh, Logan. I just... The Johnny Crash trailer got 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 me in, pulled me in. I like kind of the darkness. Um, you know, I don't like the superhero movies kind of get, get predictable to me, and this one just seems like a different take on it. And I like the idea of an old Superman, old man, old super, old, old superhero, <laughs> old man Logan's got me intrigued. Number two, actually, Train Spotting too, man. Choose Life, man. That movie came <laughs> out at a very important time in my life. It was a movie when I was in film school. I want to see. Is it worth it 20 years later? I think it will be. I don't think anyone would have come back if they aren't doing it the right way. So I'm just intrigued. Since I don't believe in love, I don't have to see Beauty and the Beast first. <laughs> I can wait a little bit. I'm going to see it. Number three, this sounds like it's a joke pick, but it isn't. King Arthur, Legend of the Sword, because I'm a big King Arthur Pendragon fan. I, I read a lot of books, love the myth, and I don't think they're going to get it right again, and I want to see how bad it is. Uh, and, and I have some hope that maybe it could be good. I'm not rooting against it. I want a good King Arthur movie. The Clive Owen one uh, from a few years ago wasn't as bad as I thought, but still wasn't there. I still think we can get one. I'm going to be there. May soon. I remind you yeah. that Kong Skull Island yeah. features Kong <laughs> Understood, and it looks good. I love 60s rock music and John Goodman together again, man. I love it, and I'm going to be there. If you give me a top five, Cog Squad is in there, but I just want to see what they do. Jeremy, what about your top three? Um, okay, so here, it was really funny that we're all addressing the fact that March is this huge month, month now because it does look like the summer movie season for the past couple of years has gotten farther and farther earlier back. And it was May, and then it became April. I mean, even last year, Batman vs. Superman came out in March. So now March is now a uh, summer movie month, I guess. Hey, welcome. Welcome, March. We love you. <laughs> uh, all right, so here we go. Logan's got to be number one because, A, I, I love the, the tone of it. B, I love the fact that it's going to be a bittersweet thing where it's like it's Logan's last movie it has Patrick Stewart Logan can save a piece of himself who actually isn't him it's this other girl I, and I, I want to walk out of there weeping I really do um, Kong Skull Island number two for Thank every you. reason that, not a problem Mark because Mark gave me 20 bucks before we came on and he said hey man have my back uh, but uh I mean, it's Kong. It, it not only does it look exciting, but it's setting up something bigger to come. And f only all right, everything you said about King Arthur is the fact that this movie has my curiosity. If it's <laughs> awesome, great. If it sucks, the review is going to be fun too. But I want to see what they do with Mighty Morphin Power Rangers because <laughs> if it's horrible, then like I said, everything, everything Ken just said about uh, King Arthur is applicable to my view of Power Rangers, but it's the movie. I only require two good movies in a month. And if my top two are them, then hey, let's take a gamble on the one that may or may not suck. I don't know, but I'm morbidly curious as to what they've done with it. Uh, actually, Wendy, I'm curious, what would be your top three movies that you'd be looking forward to in March? Well, March is my anniversary month, my wedding anniversary. So uh, Beauty and the Beast will be number one for me. <laughs> and then what? No, don't, Ken's like, I'm so disappointed in you. <laughs> We're going to go see Beauty and the Beast together. Number two, uh, it is going to be Logan. And then number three, I don't know between Khan or Ghost in the Shell, but after seeing the Khan uh, Skull Island trailer, I think I'm going to go with Khan at number three. All right, jump in the comment section, guys. Let us know what would be your top three for March. Okay, guys, I told you that at the end of the show, we'll be saving a little bit of time for some live Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. Wendy, what questions have you picked out? First one comes from Doom Metal Guy, who writes, <laughs> Would have Disney been more successful with different Rogue One from Saga movies if they had used clips from Episode 4 in the promos? I think it was a good move not to use clips from episode four in the promos. I, I think that they've been trying to show it as, look, this is its own movie. This is its own story. And besides the fact that we'd get good glimpses of Vader, and I think that's enough of any allusion to the original four. So I think it was the right move. What do you think? Yeah, the the uh, the clips from episode four worked for the Revenge of the Sith trailer, the teaser trailer where Obi-Wan's monologuing. And you see, you know, uh, it, 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 that worked for that. I don't want to see that for a spinoff movie. I want the movie to be able to stand on its own because it's in when a movie has to live in another film's shadow. So I think they did it right. Ken. Uh, yeah, you the uh, first Rogue One teaser, the celebration teaser, which really wasn't official, it was just shown at the thing, had right. the Obi-Wan stuff from New right. Hope, and that works, that's effective for me, but I don't think you need it here. Also, you know, <laughs> it was shot in 75, 76, it's going to look different than something shot in 2015, you know, 16. Yeah, I would have felt It would have been kind of jarring a little bit. Oh, Come on, man, Mark. this is that is a really tough question all of a sudden because they did shoot their wad with Revenge of the Sith, which they didn't know other movies were going to come out. So you play the hand you're dealt at the time. I understand that. I would have loved to have seen them do what they did in that teaser we saw at Celebration 
and expound upon that. A, because I get the chills every time I hear Alec Guinness as Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yeah. I think that's the right conduit for this movie to sell itself as a prequel to A New Hope. And I don't think that these trailers, and even this new one that we talked about earlier in the show, have done the best job of letting the layperson know that this is not episode eight, that this is not taking place after Ray and Finn and all those people, that it is taking place right before. I know they show you the Death Star. I know they show you Darth Vader. Sometimes you have to beat people over the head to let them know clearly where this movie takes place. I think a fun way to do that <sighs> could have been using a clip from A New Hope. I'd like to see that trailer for no other reason because I love trailers, John. All right, what's next? Nolan Dean writes, on Alien Covenant, do you hope it's more like Alien or Aliens? <laughs> Both movies are <laughs> really different but great in their own ways. Um, you one. know what? I think if um, Prometheus didn't exist, I would say I would want it to be more like the original Alien. But in a world where Prometheus did happen, which I think they tried, if you took those two Alien and Aliens, I think they tried to make Prometheus more like Alien. I'm ready for the Xenomorphs to go wild. So I, I'm gonna, I would say I would hope it leans more towards Aliens, the second one. What do you think? I, I, I'm not sure what I hope. I think it's going to lean more towards the original. I think it's going to be more towards that, which is a horror movie vibe as opposed to the great action flick we got with Aliens. Because I think that that's what Ridley Scott wants to tell. That's the story that he wants to do. I don't think he wants to lean on the Xenomorphs as heavily, or at least having multiple of them where it's just this one thing that you got to really wonder what the hell is going on, what is this, we need to stop it. I think that you're going to get more of an Aliens vibe with whatever Neil Blomkamp wants to do with it when we get that movie. So I think this one's going to be more of the original Alien. Ken. Alien versus Predator. That's the style <laughs> I would hear. You know, I, get, I think Carl Weathers is free to throw him in there down the line. I think, John, you're right. It needs to kind of go in a bigger, more, I don't want to say action, but you know what I mean? Those, those, yeah. those big things. But I, I think what Prometheus set up, it's going to be more Alien. What do you think, Jeremy? I, uh, I, I'm i going the other way. I, I want it to be more alien. I want it to be more subtle and dark and dreary and, you know, like wet dripping off of the ship where for some reason, I guess there's a lot of moisture in these things, but I want that. <laughs> I want I, I want people to go around the corner with very minimal weaponry and not know what's over there and someone turns a dark corner and all of a sudden, ah! and then they get hit with, you know, like, I, I, I want that OG alien vibe. So I'm going alien one, the first one. All right, now remember guys, at the beginning of this show, I asked you to join us on Twitter and answer a poll question for us, which was, now that we've seen the final trailer for Rogue One and we're seeing that you know the ticket sales online kind of crashed some sites again, did you think that Rogue One on its opening weekend will make over or under $150 million? Wendy, up to this point, what is the poll telling us? We've had a lot of people voting, and you guys don't doubt Star Wars because 67% voted for over $150 million and 33% voted for under $150 million. All right, now we're going to revisit this poll again on tomorrow's Movie Talk. So if you're not watching us live, you can go to our Twitter page. Once again, we're, you can find us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Vote on that poll, and we'll say what you guys said. Right now, over 150 seems to be well in the lead. All right, Wendy, what is our last Twitter question today? Last one comes from Andre C. A7 who writes, do you think we can get a young Carrie Fisher in Rogue One like we saw young Robert Downey Jr. in Civil War? You know, I, th I think we've addressed this question once before. I don't think they will, and I don't think there's a need to. Um, I think maybe we could hear a voice over a comm, or maybe a view from behind, but do they need to do a full CG thing, CGI thing where you see her as a younger self? I don't think there's a need to do that. If they do, I'm sure they'll make it fit in well. And it would be fine. And for this story, we know where this story is going to end. It would fit, but I don't think there's a need to do it. So I don't think they will. What do you think? I, there's a need for connective <laughs> tissue with, with having Princess Leia and, and letting us know that she exists in this universe, that we know her whereabouts. I don't think you need to visually see her either. I think you're right, John. If we know those things or you hear something on a comm, I... I, I I, if I had to bet on it, though, I think you do see some sort of shot of a Princess Leia. Whether she's way off in the distance and they just use somebody like a, an extra to play the role of her. Maybe it's her daughter. I don't know how they do it. I bet you you get to see something that is Princess Leia. What screen. do you think? Yeah, I think uh, I, I'm with you. In some way, shape, or form, we're going to see a Leia. It's one of these things where I want to sit back and be like, well, we don't need it. 
but they have the technology to do it and make it work. We have seen it in movies. And I feel like if they do it and pull it off well, like the last one like crawls to her and gives her the hard drive and dies in her arms or something, if they can pull it off and have the tech to make it organically mix together and look like young Princess Leia, I feel like we'd walk out of that movie going, I don't know how they couldn't have had that in there. You know what I mean? And that's what I really want. I mean, the last so. shot of the movie could be handing over the plans right. to Princess Leia, yeah. who is then going to hand them over to R2-D2, and then right. we get the sweeping music, we walk out happy, forgetting that everybody else in the movie died. Yeah, so. <laughs> what do you think, Ken? You can say it. Um, actually, the plans were beamed aboard this starship. <laughs> Gentlemen, they're not going to be handed to anyone. Um, I, true. There's a disinvolved somewhere. No. I is do that think true? if you're going to do it, you're going to do it at the end. Maybe, like I said, over this uh, behind-the-scenes shot, like when Peter Sellers passed on, and then they put him in the, the Pink Panther movie, which just behind the camera shots. Um, but if you go, and this gets into, this is a Jedi Council thing. We may have even talked about it in Council. In Lost Stars by Claudia Gray, there is an Imperial Ball for graduates of the Academy. It is a key moment for the story yep. and the characters. Princess Leia is there because, again, she's part of the Imperial Senate. And during that ball, the events of Rogue One are actually happening. They reference it. Princess Leia is nervous. She's got, pe there's something pensive about it. There's something going on. So for the bulk of the movie, she's at a ball. But I think if you're going to see it, it's going to be at the end with some kind of little shot. There was a, a floppy of a party. disc that she owned. They beamed the, the plans aboard. I, like, like, you would send me a document. No, you put it on a disk drive. It got beamed, and then Captain Tilly's downloaded it into a Windows 98 CD-ROM. <laughs> uh, like, give it to R2. I, I, I do have to address, like, was it really beamed on board a ship? That's yes. the lines they say, yeah. So, yeah. okay, Space so Internet. It, it was beamed. SpaceNet. And then they're like, all right, we're getting boarded. Should we beam the plans somewhere else? No, we'll put it in a droid. Don't question yeah, They George's could have been logic. intercepted if they tried yeah. to beam them off. They yeah. had to physically protect it. Well, the way it works is you can intercept, but it just really makes a I, I feel I, they need to physically <laughs> give it to her. It's in breaking order Jeremy's for, brain. In order for Star Wars to make if, sense. If, if you are not deleting the text that you send on a weekend, be, you need to start doing that. <laughs> Because right. the NSA is watching you, and your goon isn't going to save you <laughs> from all the information they're going to release. What did you always yourself. say what best friends do? Oh, dude, scrub your hard drive for sure. <laughs> if you die, they scrub your, your – if you die suddenly, your best friend, you know what they do? They scrub your hard drive Ab for you. Absolutely. <laughs> but I, I'm just saying, like, you know, when the emails go out, they're now in two different places. It doesn't just – you know, it's, it's – it, they should beam it. And then scrub the hard drive because they're <laughs> pals, and that's what pals did. <laughs> All right, guys, that'll do it for us for this episode of uh, Collider Movie Talk. Thanks so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of other shows on Collider right now. Head on over to our YouTube channel. Take a look around. Lots of great stuff, including the newest Crash Course video of everything you need to know about Rogue One before going in to see the movie. That one is up right now. I want to thank all the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting over there, Mr. Ken Knapsack. Ken, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at Ken Knapsack. You know, there's a rumor going around that I hate a lot of things in the movie world. That's not true. I once watched Pretty Woman five times in yes, one he day. Did. Yes, yeah, he did. I love yes. that movie. <laughs> right beside him, we have Mr. Jeremy Johns. Uh, Ken watched Pretty Woman five times, and after that, he was like, no beauty and the beast for me i'm <laughs> dead inside i guess uh you can find me on youtube instagram and twitter at jeremy johns facebook at real jeremy johns i love you all sitting right here we've got mark ellis pretty woman the all-time best comedic performance by jason alexander yes watch the movie again you guys can find me on twitter at mark ellis live and this weekend i'm gonna be in nashville atlanta and st louis doing yucks you guys can get tickets at mark ellis live.com over there we got wendy lee wendy where can people find you you can find me on youtube at the movie couple channel and on twitter instagram Instagram and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. Now, Ashley Mova had to slip out to go to an appointment, so she's gone a little bit early. So, happy whatever day it is. It's just not as effective. <laughs> not as effective I at like all. The I day. thought it was going to work. It didn't work. But make sure you follow Ashley on Twitter at Ashley Mova. And you guys can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter simply at John Campia. Thanks a lot for joining us, guys. My name is John Campia. And until next time, bye bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.